Okay, so this is our <coughs> volume of a sphere accumulation. So, uh, and we're in the pro we're in the journey of you know how much of something you have at every moment. So this would be you know how much volume you have for any radius. You want to know how fast that volume is changing for any radius. So that would be the current journey that we're on. So this particular context applied to this current journey that we're on. So you know the volume for any radius. You want to know how fast the volume is changing for any radius. And so we said we started by doing these, these fixed intervals, which we're calling h. So, and our approximate accumulation function looked like this. So these, I'm having, here's an h of 0.4. So h could have been 0.5, it could have been 0.3, it could have been 0.2, so just there's nothing, nothing magic about 0.4. But what happens here is once we set those intervals, then we get the same constant rate through the whole interval. So let me pause that. So just want to make the distinction between this and what, we're what the new improved version is. So we set these intervals, 0 to 0.4. 0.4 to 0.8, 0.8 to 1.2, and then we have the same constant rate throughout each interval, right? So the constant rate that we have at 0.3 in the approximate volume function is the same as the constant rate at 0.1. And then when we get to point, the second interval, for every x value in that interval, we have the same approximate constant rate whether it's 0.41 or 0.68 or 0.79, as long as we're in that interval, all those x values get assigned the same constant rate for that this approximating volume function, the pink one. Okay? But then we said so and we, we followed that through to the end and we got a we got a formula for the uh, the approximate rate function, which would be steps, right? Because for those intervals of 0.4, you got the same constant rate all the way through that interval. That's why we got the steps, right? That's why we got the steps. But then we said we want to enhance this. We want to make it a little better. And that was, instead of what's shown in black, we want to now think about a sliding interval so that the current value of x is always the left side of the interval. And so now we're going to be focusing on what's there in blue. And so now the left side of any interval is always the current value of x. And so this interval slides smoothly, slides smoothly so that if we take a particular, so if we come here and we take a particular, so this is here, this is for 0.4. Okay, so this is for x equals 0.4. So we're going to, we would, get that rate of change according to that blue line. It's a constant rate for that blue line. And we would assign it to x equals 0.4. But what about 0.5? Do we have that same rate at x equals 0.5 now? No. no. So to get now the rate for a slightly greater x value, even though it's in this interval now, if we want the rate for, a, say, 0.5, well, then things change. So it's a new rate because now at 0.5, x equals 0.5 is the left side of the interval. So, so what happens? The, the approximate rate, which is shown visually by that blue line, is now continually changing. It's not fixed in those intervals as it slides. So you see that blue line is continually changing in its inclination. And so that the approximate rate is continually changing. So let's just, let's isolate a particular value here, say, here's 0.51, okay? So at 0.51, let's start at 0.51 by saying, so we know how to, to find the exact, or a good, very, very close to exact, uh, the rate of change at 0.51. Do you remember doing that? We did that a while ago. How would we do that? Oh, so I, I forgot to tell you. Now that we're all, we're, we're, all cozy up here in the front. We're more like a regular class, right? So we're all, I have a list of your names. And I'm going to start calling on you randomly. Um, but uh, the list is designed such that if I call on you, 
your name may come up very shortly after that. It's just the way that the randomness came out, okay? So just because I call on you once in a day doesn't mean you're not going to get called on again, and we'll, we'll see that happen. So uh, be ready. So when I put you to work, I put you to work, you're going to do the work, and then when we regroup, I'm going to ask you guys questions, or I might just ask questions during the lecture, but I've got my list. Okay, so here at point five one, I want to I want to figure out the exact rate of change at point five one, uh, recalling back to what we did maybe in the first month. So where is uh, Bailey Rich? Bailey here. Do you remember how we did that? How do we find the exact rate of change given, say, this x value of point five one? I want exact though. So I want the exact rate of change at this moment, 0.51. So what would I do? So it sounds like you're doing more an approximate with a, with a larger interval. So how would, how would I, I want to get the exact rate of change here. Yeah, sure. Nope, so exact rate of change. Where's Kimberly Ren Renfrow? That's still about a big interval, right? This big interval. So I want exact rate of change. Yes, sir? Uh, would you zoom in until you found a linear portion? Right. Right. So just remember, to get rate of change at a moment, like an exact rate of change, we've got to get a small enough part of that so it's like linear, right? So I'm going to come here. And I'm going to zoom in. Here. There we go. So do I have rate of change in a moment yet? No. Nope. Remember doing this? What about now? Well, maybe one more time. How about that? Okay, so how are we going to do this? We want to find, we've got a small enough, what, uh, interval around 0.51. It's actually down here. So here's 0.51. So I'm, gonna, I'm all zoomed in there at 0.51, and so what do I do to calculate now what will be very close to the exact rate of change? Yes, sir? Uh, take dy over dx for an interval that contains 0.51, the small moment there. Okay, so we're, we're looking at the moment, right? Okay. Yeah, so, so and we want an interval within that. Okay, so I will do, I'll look at 0.505. You guys write this down, ready? 0.505, y is 0.539464. Everyone got it? 0.539464 at x equals 0.505. And then 0.515 at 0.515. The y value is 0.572151. So can you find the exact rate of change now? Go, find the exact rate of change at Where's Ernest? Ernest, did you make it far enough for me to tell me what to do? Uh, yeah. Tell me. So you get 0.572151. Uh, 
Five, seven, two, one, five, one. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Four, six, four. Yeah. And what does just that subtraction represent? Change in Y or change in volume, right? Change in volume. Keep going. You doing good? And then uh, that's all on top of uh, 0 0.515 minus 0 0.505. And what's that bottom mean? The change in the radius. Change in the radius, right? Did you get 3.2687? Okay, cool. So what did we find out? We just found out that at the moment, for a radius of 0.51, so, so moment kind of has this time connotation, but it's not time, right? But we can still talk about a moment. You just got to remember that a moment is about a small interval of radius now. Okay, so for the, for the moment of the radius 0.51, we got this rate of change of volume of 3.2687. Okay, how would that visually be represented in our rate of change graph? How would you represent that visually in the rate of change graph, what we just found? That would be the y value associated with the x value of 5.1, I think. It okay, was. and so, and what is that? So, how, how is that represented visually then? Um, is that just one point would be corresponding to point? One point, right, one point. So, we got x equals 0.51, and what was the rate again? 3.2687. 3.2687. So, let's plot that point. Maybe. There it is. Okay, then I'll zoom back out on this graph. Okay. All right, so we just found a really close, we can, we'll just, for, for our purposes, we call that exact because we, we had a linear piece there. We got the exact rate of change at 0.51, and on a rate of change graph, that would be represented as a point, so that at 0.51 for the radius. Our, volume, our, our rate of change of volume was that 3.2687, and there's the point over there. See that? Okay, now what about, uh, now we want to go back and talk about this. <clears throat> Using this blue, right, this blue method, this blue method of the sliding interval. That's also a means of finding... Uh, the rate of change at 0.51. Okay, so what is our h right now? It's 0.4. So thinking about the sliding interval, what rate of change does it give us, the sliding interval technique give us for x equals 0.51? Find it. What rate of change does the sliding interval technique give us for the x value of 0.51? Go. Yes, you do, but but you could you can know that. How how would you know that? So let me clarify something that's going to help. Volume of a sphere, right? Four thirds pi r cubed. Does that help? Now you got what you need. Go.
Okay, how about where's Valerie Sotelo? Is Valerie here? Can you how about can you just get me started? Okay, so you want to plug uh, 0.51 in for R. Let's see, what did I call this here? Let's see. Okay, so I have, I have defined that as f of x, okay, in, in, this, in this file, so we're, we're going to use that. So can we set up an expression to make this easier on ourselves? I have defined it in this file as, as f of x, so... How can I set this up? Yeah, so it'd be f of. Okay, is that going to go here? So to get the change in y, we're going to do final minus initial, right? So the point five one is actually the initial. So what will go in the first one? 0.91 divided by? Point 0.4, the change, that, right? So that's, that's how much the volume changes for point 0.4. Did you get 6.50226? Yes. Okay. All right, so. Is that the same as the rate of change we got, the exact rate of change? No, not even close. Why not? Yeah, so, so by zooming in so far, it's kind of like we, we're considering a really, really small h. Here we've got this huge h of 0.4. And so now, if I zoom in, At that point, let's see both at the same time. So the black quote line, right? The back black line is what we use. That's the actual volume curve. The volume function is what we use to calculate change in y or change in x for the exact rate of change. And then we did, we used this blue line, right, which is based on a change of x of 0.4, really, really large, right, really large. And so, which one is greater? Of course, yes. So, and, and that's shown by the number, right? So, you can see that the rate of change is greater. You've got a greater change in y on that blue line for, for the same change in x uh, compared to the black line. And then the numbers prove that out. Okay, so if we were to, to graph the rate of change according to the blue sliding interval with h of 0.4, then at 0.51 we would get what? We'd get 0.51 and 6.502. I'll make that blue. Okay, so here's the exact rate of change at 0.51, or it's the correspondence point for the exact rate of change. Here's this approximate. So if I put this thing in motion, so if we did that for every x value using the blue sliding interval, if we did that for every x value using the blue sliding, sliding interval, would we get ex exact rate of change? No. Would it be steps? No. What would it be? It would still be a continuously changing uh, curve, but it's not exact because the rate of change for any of those x values determined by the blue line is not the exact rate of change determined by a very small part of the curve. So, So here is the approximate rate of change function being generated with a con consistent h of 0.4. Okay. So unlike the first method, when we do it this way, 
we get that rate of change for now x is what? 0.67. We get the rate of change for x equals 0.67, and we assign it to x equals 0.67, but then as soon as x increases a little bit more, it's going to be a different rate of change. Now it's 0.71, and we would recalculate because we have a different rate of change. But these are all approximate rates of change because of that large interval h of 0.4. So how do we take this sliding technique and make it more exact? Make h smaller, okay? So when we make h smaller, what? The two points that we use are going to be closer. The, the second point will be closer to x. So here we go. Watch it. So here is h of, there's h of about 0.2. So notice the, the second point is much closer to x. <coughs> and now the approximate curve is lower because those rates of change are lower, they're closer to the exact. So we can keep doing that, keep making h smaller. And so here is h of 0 0.005. That's still two points there, that's still two points, kind of like if we had zoomed in. And now our approximate, it looks like it, it even looks like it's going through the point that we calculated for the exact rate of change. Okay, so we want to then, so this technique is, it, it is exact, this, this blue sliding technique does give the exact rate, rate of change as long as h is small enough, as long as h is small enough. So uh, the last question on your quiz was to come up with a general formula for that, which was in your reading. <clears throat> so let's make h a little bit bigger again. And we want to, so now, now we consider this to be any x and any h. So this is any x, so I'm showing 0.77, but this could be any value. <coughs> and then this h could be also any value, any interval width. Okay, and so given those Given that x is variable and h is also variable, uh, it could, could, we could change it if we wanted to. <coughs> what is the rate of change associated with the blue line? So you're going to do this. You're going to do it the same way we've done the other calculations for those two points. But now you just have some some variable. You have the variable x and uh, the, the parameter h, right? So it's h stays the same for a given situation. So given x and h, how would you how would you now calculate the rate of change associated with that blue line if this function is f, right? If this function is f. Okay, so if you, we're gonna just do it again. So do it like, uh, even if you've gotten it before, do it again, step by step, show all your work. <coughs> <coughs> or you may be doing it for the first time. Okay, so what is the rate of change associated with the blue line for any x value and for any interval with h? Set it up. And that will be our formula for the rate of change. Go. <coughs> Oh,
So we're setting up a formula for the rate of change of the blue line for any value x at any interval with h. Where is Amy? Die. Amy, die. Do you know how to start? Can you tell me anything about getting started for that? So how, how am I going to write the, so how, how do we do it before? How am I going to write the rate of change of that blue line, just in general? What do I need to do? No? Because I'm looking for M. I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to write what M is. Hold on a sec. Hold on a sec. So how did we how did we get the rate of change when we for these points? Remember, where's Ivy Davis? Can you just get me started? How how am I gonna get started on this? Okay, right. So we're gonna need we're gonna need the coordinates of these points. And so this formula is going to essentially be what she said. It's going to be y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And we just need change in y over change in x. So we need to write all those things in terms of f and x and h. Want to keep going? Yeah. All right. Okay. So let's start. So we said y1 is? The y coordinate of that first point is f of x. That's what, yeah, that's f of x, right? And what's the y coordinate of the second, y2, the second point here? Right, because it's going to be x plus h over here. It's going to be the y coordinate or the volume for a, a radius of x plus h. x plus h. That corresponding volume is f of x plus h. So there's our change in y. And then all over the change in x, which is h. So why don't we have left x anymore? Why don't we have left x anymore? Exactly. x is always left x with the sliding interval. x is always left x with the sliding interval. No matter what x is, that's where we start. So this is a much more advantageous way to think about this. That's why we kind of use this different version, this enhanced version of the previous. Because left x is gone, and we can just use x as our left x. OK, questions about that. So this is so r2, meaning for r for the, the enhanced version, f of x plus h minus f of x over h. And so is that approximate or exact rate of change? Is that approximate or exact rate of change? Some are saying approximate. Some are saying exact. It depends. It depends on h. It could be either. If h is not small, then it will be approximate, the way I'm showing it now. right? So I'm showing h as 0.27. In the scheme of things, that's not small. right? But if I make h small, So here's point zero zero five, and based on it going right through that red point that we calculated exact, we could we could call it a day here. Point zero zero five, and say that's small enough. We can't tell the difference anymore. We can't tell the difference anymore between exact and approximate. Okay, so this is all right. So there there's the exact. That's the exact, and then the blue. Uh, approximate is being generated over the top of it, but with h so small, they're virtually the same. So, in the next, so this is the key. This is our rate of change function. Right? Because what is, what is f? It's how much we have, right? f is the volume at any radius. And so now we just were able to generate how fast that, that volume is changing. 
at any radius. It's that function, right? So we, we've, in a sense, we've kind of, uh, this is kind of a milestone in this backward journey. We know how much of something we have or how much has accumulated. We want to know how fast it's accumulating. Well, that's how fast it's accumulating. f of x plus h minus f of x over h. If h is not small, then that will be approximate. If h is really small, <coughs> that's exact. So what about h? So h small. Or h, h is small. So we've got a couple ways to say h is small, mathematically. One way we can do that is we can use equals with a dot over it and say zero. The same. Essentially zero. Essentially zero. This is one way to say h is small. Another way to say that is lim for limit. h as h approaches zero. Now you would never just write that by itself. So we, were, we would write limit as h approaches zero of this, of this. And that's also saying let h get small enough so that we can't tell the difference between approximate and exact. Could we just make h equal to zero? Why can't we just make h equal to zero? Can we do it? Right, exactly. You can't. So, and, and we're finding rate of change. That means we need to we need to think about a little bit of change, right? We got to have a little bit of change in order to talk about rate of change. So, if h is zero, it's kind of like we're talking about an instant and not a moment, right? So, it's just at a point. Okay. So, yes, we can't divide by zero. Question. Uh, so, like, let's say on a quiz, we would just write the limit h approaches zero next to our our answer. Uh, well, so th this now secures that it's this is always exact. This this expression always exact rate of change if you do that. Okay, but just this the ratio part of it could be exact or could be approximate depending on what your h is. But when you put the limit as h approaches zero in front of it, now you're you're saying h is small enough so you can't tell the difference. So now it's exact. But this is, this is, uh, could be either, right? So we can, we can think about it either. It just depends on what H is. But the limit as H approaches zero, that's saying make H really, really small so that we can't tell the difference between exact and approximate rate of change. Okay, other questions? Yes. Oh, please. Is it just coincidence that the rate of change the same? Say it again now. Huh? The left and the right one. Oh yeah, because we, I mean, every one we've done so far has looked totally different, right? Yeah. It's just for this example. Yeah, so we saw lots of examples. Every example we've done so far where we generated a, a rate function from accumulation, they didn't look the same, right? It's just for volume, because this is increasing and concave and, and curved up like that. That means the rate is, is uh, positive and increasing also. But all, every example we've done so far in the reverse process, the rate function looked drastically different than the accumulation function. Okay. <coughs> Other questions? Okay, what's next? Okay, so we've got this, this is our rate of change function, and we got our, our function is 4 thirds pi r cubed, right? So what this allows us to do is, is we can actually find, so far, so, so we graph that exact rate function, but, but we don't have a closed form, right? A closed form, meaning what is a, a formula for that curve that, that gives us rate of change for any x? Well, we're we're just we're really close to getting that if we just um, if we just apply algebra to this expression f of x plus h minus minus f of x over h, we could now that we know we know that f is four thirds pi r cubed, 
So if we apply the algebra, we can actually generate a closed form expression here. So, um, and that's what we want because they, those generate results really fast and they're easy to calculate, right? They're easy to compute. <clears throat> so, I'm going to start with what is f of x plus h? So in order to say what is f of x plus h, I really want to say what, what does the rule 4 thirds pi r cubed, what, what, is, what set of instructions is that to give us the value of the dependent variable? So we've got the dependent variable. What does that tell us to do with the, with the ind sorry, independent, what does that tell us to do with the independent variable to get the corresponding value of the dependent variable? He said cube, cube the value and then multiply by 4 thirds pi. Is that what that says? Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay, so the rule says we're going to cube the input and then multiply the result by 4 thirds pi. That's what f <coughs> says to do to get the corresponding value of the dependent variable, in this case volume. So then what, what would f of x plus h mean? Well, you're going to, you're going to, Follow the rule, right? So f of x plus h would mean same thing, cube the input and multiply the result by 4 thirds pi. So what would we get when we did that? Where is, where's bigger? Bigger, bagger, carabe? Sorry if I mispronounced your name. If the rule for f says take the input and cube it and multiply by 4 thirds pi, then what is f of x plus h? Can you tell me? So let's start with the first part. What would it mean to cube the input? If it was f of x plus h, what would it mean to cube the input? What would that be? What's that? What is the input of f of x plus h? Not sure. Okay. Where is Zimming? Zong? Yeah. Well, what will f of x plus h be if f says to take the input and cube it and multiply by 4 thirds pi? Nice and loud. I got some noise behind me here. So the input is x plus h. So first we're going to do what? I'm having trouble hearing you. So the input's x plus h. First we're going to cube it, right? So following the rule, it says cube the input and then multiply by 4 thirds pi. So that's what f of x plus h is, right? And then what would f of x be? What would f of x be? Where's Muhammad? Is there uh Asalehim, Asalehim, Muhammad, not here, thank you. Uh, where's Jake, Nidel? Jake, what would f of x be? Right, we're going to cube x this time and multiply it by 4 thirds pi. So we're gonna, the first thing we're going to do is cube x, multiply it by 4 thirds pi. So that rate function tells us to subtract these two and then do what? Divide by h. Okay, do you follow that? <clears throat> okay, so this is now the rate of change function, r sub f of x, for our particular value of f, 4 thirds pi r cubed. Right, because we're going to take x plus h and cube it times 4 thirds pi minus 4 thirds pi x cubed, which is f of x, divided by h. Do you see it? Any questions with that? All right, and so let me just... Uh, and that's, like I said, that's the rate change function for this particular function, f. So let me show you something pretty slick that GC can do. Somewhere. Come on. There we go. All right. So watch. So I put that in uh, for 
in GC. So or GC is going to help us with the algebra here. So especially like if that x plus h cubed maybe it was to the fifth or to the eighth, and it'd be it'd be really ugly. So we can let uh, GC help us. So I'm gonna I'm gonna highlight that x plus h cubed, and if I go to math here, expand. It'll expand it for us. Okay. So let's copy and paste that. So now what I want to do is I want to take this 4 thirds pi and I want to multiply it into this expression. So you see the hand come up, so I'm just going to take it and grab it and stick it like that and now it's just multiplied times all those inside. Okay, now notice what happened. So look at the first term, 4 thirds pi x cubed. What do you see at the end there? There's a minus 4 thirds pi x cubed. Alright, so if I now if I, I'll take this whole thing, copy and paste. So now if I highlight the whole top and do simplify, it will subtract off those, you got the positive and the negative version of the same term. And I'll do simplify and it'll go bye-bye. So now we just got those three terms. And what's true about every one of those three terms? They have 4 pi, that's true, but there's something else that they have. H. Yeah, the key is that they all, now the ones that are left all have H. Watch, so I'm going to highlight the H there and get the hand on it, and then I'm going to pull it out. I just factored out the H, and so why did I do that? Yeah, so now that H over H simplifies to 1. So I've got... If I take the whole expression now and do simplify, now I've got an expression that I can't really simplify that anymore. So 4 pi x squared plus 4 pi hx plus 4 pi h squared over 3. What is that? What does that mean? We did also, I, so we did a lot of algebra there. I used GC to do a lot of algebra, but what, let's not lose track. What is that thing? Yeah. The rate of change. Yeah, it's still, it's still equal to that very first expression that I wrote. So this is still, for this particular function f, it's the rate of change function. Just in a simplified version, right? And closed form, right? Closed form. Now we want exact rate of change. What does exact rate of change mean? H is really, really small. Okay, so let's go back to the PowerPoint. So we've got this, this, this what? It still has H's in it, so it could be approximate or it could be exact, depending on the size of H. But here, look, we've got, we've got a closed form for the rate function, the rate of change of volume with respect to radius. I'll speed these up. Okay, and so from GC we found that, right? We found that that, that expression, the rate of change, is 4 pi x squared plus 4 pi hx plus 4 pi h squared over 3. Or are you kidding? Okay, so... Again, exact or approximate? Depends on H, right? Sorry, I lost my pen here. Okay, so this thing right here is the rate of change function for our particular value of or particular function f, and so it could be exact or approximate. So now I want it to be exact. So for exact, what do I do? Yeah, so we could I could write the limit as h approaches 0, or I could, so let's just use this other thing. I want h essentially 0. 
And when h is essentially 0, what does this thing become? So what happens to 4 pi x squared when h gets small? 4 pi x squared. Nothing. It doesn't care what h, right? It has nothing to do with h. It doesn't care what h is. So it's going to stay as 4 pi x squared. What about that second term? Yeah, so h is multiplied in there. So as h gets very, very small, it's going to get, the whole thing's going to get very, very small. So that will be essentially 0. Same with this. So when h is really small, we've got 4 pi x squared, which is what exact rate of change? Closed or open form? Closed form. Cranks out results really easily. Okay? So what did we, so that we did 0.51, right? So our, our rate function, so we got rate of change of x equals 4 pi x squared. So it took us a minute to, to come up with that exact rate for 0.51. What about now? Using this, how would we do the rate at 0 0.51? What do we do? Okay. Yeah, so do 4 pi times 0 0.51 squared. Two six nine. Is that what we got when we did it? Right. So we, we zoomed in. We got the two points. We did change in y over change in x, and we got this number. So that was a long process. Look at the advantage of a closed form expression. You just plug 0.51 into that formula, and it just cranks it out. Right. So advantage of a closed form expression. Okay, so this is, all right, so what does that number mean now? What is 3.269? What does it mean? Let's have everyone think about it. So, okay, yes, it's the rate of change of volume with respect to radius when the radius is 0.51. But what does the number 3.269 mean? So yes, that's what it is. Yes, 3.269 is the rate of change of volume with respect to radius when the radius is 0.51. But what does that value, 3.269, mean? It's the rate of change at the moment, 0.51. Right. The, right. It is the rate of change. But that's not the meaning of that number. Where is Amber Burnett? Do you know what that number means, 3.269? Yes, it is the rate of change with re of the volume with respect to radius when the radius is 0.51. But what does that number mean? So at where is, hold on, where is Leo? Yeah, what does that number mean? He said a change in the volume is 3.269 times the change in the radius. Does that, is that, remember that? Do you agree with that or do you want to say something different? Is it during that moment? Okay, yeah, is it, so yeah, right. So you remember this? Given a change in radius, given a change in radius, the corresponding change in volume would be 3.269 times that change in radius, but now it would only be for, for a moment around point. 0.51, when the race is 0.51. Remember the, the first couple weeks of class, remember when we did all that stuff? So let's, let's figure it out. So it's, it means, given a small change in radius, hopefully it's at least ringing bells, given a small change in radius, near r equals 0 0.51, 
The corresponding, I'll let you finish. Go, you finish. Where's Ian Doyle? Oh, Can you finish it for me? The corresponding change in volume uh -huh. is 3.269 times the change in rate. That's right. So that was how we made meaning of a rate of change. dy equals mdx, dy equals mdx. That given any small change in radius, now, now we have to put this condition on it, that it's a, a small change near 0.51. Why? Because that, that rate of change is continually changing, right? But given a small change in radius near 0.51, the corresponding change in volume is 3.269 times that change in radius. We worked hard on that. We worked hard on that. So and we got it. Good. <laughs> okay, so uh, given that fact, can you estimate some weight down here? <coughs> <coughs> so let's apply our, our let's apply that meaning that we just came up with. Instead of, so yes, we could take 5.5106 and we could plug it into the volume formula. <coughs> but let's use this rate of change, 3.269, instead to estimate the volume when the radius is 0 0.506. Sorry, 0 0.5106. All right, give it a shot. Estimate the volume of the sphere. So, so this whole time we've been talking, we, we haven't assigned a unit, okay? So... The whole time, this could have been inches and inches cubed. This could have been meters and meters cubed, millimeters and millimeters cubed. So we've just been unitless, and that's fine. But can you express the volume when, or estimate the volume when R is 0 0.5106 using the fact that the rate of change at 0.51 is 3.269? Again, applying big ideas we've done in the past. See if you can do it. Go, see if you can do it. All right, where's Derek Dagenau? Is Derek here? Any idea? Um, what you guys, what you guys talk about? I was thinking that essentially, like, like I don't know, I'm just starting from zero. 
We'll actually start from 0.51. A radius of 0.51 to a radius of 0.5106 implies what? So that's where we start. A radius of 0.51 to a radius of 0.5106 implies change in radius of 0 0.0006. That's where we start. So we got a change in radius of 0.006. Right, to get what? That's right. So then a change or change in volume would be what he said, 3.269 times that change in radius. And is that, will that give us the volume, an estimate for the volume at 0.5106? No, no. it'll give us the change, change in volume. So therefore, the volume estimate at What is our volume estimate? It's about. Well, no. So that's the change, whatever that is. So that's some number. We'll just we'll just keep it as dv. That's some number. But how would now we get the actual our estimate for the volume if this is the amount of change? So would you use your y final plus y initial plus change in line? Okay. Use the original equation for the first pi r cubed. For on what? That's right. Very good. So it's going to be initial volume, which would be f of 0 0.51 plus the change, which we calculated using constant rate of change. So we have done this before, so it should feel familiar. So that approximate volume would be the starting volume, f of 0 0.51, whatever that is. We can use 4 thirds pi r cubed. Plus the change that we get for the change in radius of 0 0.006, 0 0.006, which is our MDR. Does that make sense?